Uh, you all know who I am. I'm Dave Craig. I'm general counsel here at Reef Holdings. Today, I thought what we would do, since we didn't really get to application of choice of entity ideas, we talked uh, entirely last week about the various forms of organizations and the characteristics and some of the reasons why you would or wouldn't use a particular form of entity. We didn't talk about um, some of the more complex issues like tiered entities like we do. Uh, if you've seen any of our org charts, and I'm sorry I don't have one here in front of me uh, to throw up, you know, on, but if you've seen some of our org charts, you know that we do holding companies on the top and then downstream subsidiaries to own the properties, and it, it, whether it's a hotel arrangement or, uh, or a multifamily arrangement. Um, and then we have some iterations on that, depending upon the particular deal, those sorts of things. In some cases, in most cases, we use limited liability companies. In some cases, we've used a combination of limited liability companies and a corporation. In some cases, we've used a combination of limited liability companies and, and a limited one or more limited partnerships. So there are a variety of, of ways that we can structure tiered entities and entities that can that relate to each other or might be affiliates of each other. We might loosely use the word affiliate um, to describe that in, in, in the whole uh, corporate, and I've used corporate not to refer specifically to corporations, but the organizational structure of a particular deal. Or, oh, oh, okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll just carry on, sorry. Um, so, so I thought today what we would do is talk a bit more about the kinds of issues that, that should um, raise our concerns about structuring and what choices of entity we use, and then what kind of, uh, I'm going to call it family or organizational structure we would use for a particular kind of deal. And we'll talk about a couple of those applications that we've used here at Reef, and I'll talk to you about a couple of applications that we don't use here at Reef because we don't fall into these particular characteristics that would that would tend to drive you toward a different kind of organizational structure or solution. Right? Okay. So, to, so the, the idea this hour is to to try to give you a bit more flesh on the general notions of entities and why we use them either alone or together, and some of the issues that drive those choices. Uh, why would we choose an LLC versus a corporation versus a tiered stacked set, set of groups or the like, and some practical applications of that. And then I'm, I've asked a couple of guys uh, from asset management and underwriting to step in later in the hour, which I presume will be about half an hour from now, maybe a little bit earlier than that, to talk about how they view financial statements, and I've given you financial statements today for one of our multifamily properties and one of our, our Delta Marriott property. And, and, and there's a particular reason why I'm going to have them come in and just, I'm going to ask them some questions and they're going to, I'm going to ask them independently. I don't want them to listen to each other's answers. And I want to hear how they view a financial statement for purposes of deciding whether uh, a particular kind of operation should be seen in a particular way, see it through their lens, and how different that is from the way we'll view it as, as lawyers getting into a deal. And so we'll talk about financial statements, and I'll talk first about how I view a financial statement, and we'll walk through them quickly, uh, you know, in about, I suppose, about half an hour from now how I view a financial statement, both balance sheet and income statement, uh, when I get into a deal. And by the way, just as an aside, as a point, you should know that one of the very first things that I ask for as an M&A lawyer in any deal in which I'm, where I'm going to represent the acquirer, the acquiring party, as we said before, buying is the hard part. Acquiring is the hard part. That's where all the work is. Selling's easy. <laughs> you just let them, let, let them have at it and if they decide to buy, they decide to buy and you close, right? That, that really, I mean, obviously there's lots of negotiation and lots of detail work, but selling's the, selling's the hard part. That's where all the diligence is. And so when I get involved in a transaction, one of the first things I'll ask a client is we sit down and talk through the general terms of the deal and whether it's going to be a combination transaction 
which then raises completely different questions other than just the client acquiring, you know, just purely acquiring. And we have some of that going on here. Right? We have a joint venture transaction that we're working on right now that will be an LLC form, but it's, it's going to come down in the form of a contribution by a third party of land into an entity that we've formed in which our part is then to come in with equity, cash equity, and management of the project and develop it out. It's going to be a, a bit of a ground up. It's a combination, but it's a bit of a ground up. Um, and so that, that raises a whole series of issues in the way we structure it. And the con contribution agreement, rather than a purchase and sale agreement, because that party's contributing the asset in, it, that requires a contribution agreement rather than simply a sale of the entity or sale of the, the asset. And we'll get to why you would be concerned about that. And by the way, I don't represent the contributing party, but my, my estimation was, as a transactional guy and a tax guy, was that absolutely the party that's contributing this in is not going to want to have gain or loss on entering into this business arrangement, right? Which they would if they sold the joint venture, the property. We have a taxable, we have taxable income at that point, establish a price, taxable income, and all of a sudden they've got a taxable transaction, resets basis and does a bunch of other things. They may not want to have any of that. They may want to carry all of that over and not have a taxable event by getting into this new JV. Most parties in that situation want to have that. So if you're, that, that's one kind of structure that we use. And, and in this case, we use a limited liability company instead of a JV. Remember what a JV is? It's a, a, the old form of it. It's a joint venture and it is a form of what? Yeah, good. General partnership, generally, right? And general partnerships, bad things. We stay away from them. And you remember why? Remember why? You had your chart in front of you, you know? Because general partners including general partners in a limited partnership, but general partners in general partnerships are, I'm going to use fancy phrase again, jointly and severally liable for all debts and obligations of the partnership. So you walk into a general partnership and that partnership incurs a debt of $100,000. You're jointly and severally liable as a general partner for a, actually for 100% of that liability. And then you fight out with your other partner if you have to pay it. You fight out with your other partner, their reimbursement of their share of the liability to you after the fact. Join several liability and your creditors don't have to go after even a slip and fall creditor. Somebody that doesn't have a contract with you like a lender can go after one party and not go after the other party in, in, in a general partnership. So liability concerns. And so this is one of the things you're going to hear throughout the next, you know, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. Liabilities. And we'll look at the balance sheet to see liabilities, but liabilities that that occur inside of business entities, whether they're extraordinary liabilities that hardly ever happen, you know, I mean, you know, lightning has to strike kind of thing, or they're regular old liabilities like payment of wages to employees, right? Payment of taxes to taxing authorities. Those things are all of concern to us when we structure when we choose the entities we're going to use and each entity choice we make, those concepts won't necessarily be the same. That is the, the results or the consequences or potential consequences won't necessarily be the same depending upon which entity type we choose. The other point that is really important that I want to make today that, and I, I really, really, really want it to stick with you guys. If you walk out of here today, I want you to walk out Wind. And there's a lot of things that we'll cover, but I don't want this to get lost, please. Never forget, and we made this point last week in the post-closed discussion we had last week, never forget that the real property business is a what business? Local. It, remember we talked about that last week? It's a local business. That is, it's localized to the spot in which the real property is located. It's not some federal business. It's not some cross-border business like a manufacturing concern, like, you know, any number of auto manufacturers. I won't use any names. 
that they're in the cross-border business, right? They may have a manufacturing facility in Detroit and in LA and a whole bunch of other places or even outside the country, right? You ship those cars in, they sell them here, sell them in other markets. They're all over the place. They have other tax and liability planning things that they're concerned about and ways that they structure their affairs to try to mitigate how those liabilities find their way through to where the real, I'm going to call it, I'm going to use some words I hadn't used with you guys before, the crown jewels, where the crown jewels of the organization, the, the enterprise are actually located, where the jurisdiction of those things are located. In real property, it's easy, right? Real property, the crown jewel is the property itself. It's located in a specific spot, and therefore, it's governed largely. Lots of its operational concerns, lots of what happens in that business operation, that enterprise, are governed by local law. Either ordinances, that literally are city ordinances, county ordinances, don't forget about the counties, cities, counties. In some states, they don't really talk about cities, they talk about boroughs, <laughs> right, or counties. They talk about, your, so you can get into that sort of stuff, especially when you get up into the Northeast, right? So, so just remember, we're talking about localized concerns, not just taxes, localized concerns. We're talking about state level concerns that will be driven. And then we get to the federal side. And generally the real property business, the federal side tends to be, and we're going to start working our way through some categories because most of what we talk about in choice of entity stuff trying to decide which kind of entity I use or which kind of structure we use is going to, is really going to be driven by some categories of concerns we have. And we can look at the, the balance sheet and the income statement, which we will, and be able to identify some of those major categories of concern that when you look at it, you say, okay, wait, I already know. And, and by the way, when you get involved in this stuff enough, you already have a checklist in your head, right? You can about click down through it without looking at a piece of paper. What, so, so why do we go back and look at a financial statement to start out with, to really uh, uh, familiarize ourselves with the enterprise? From a structuring perspective, let's stay on structuring now. We're not trying to get into an, an economic analysis of whether the business is a good one or not. That's a different question. That's done for different folks and the different reasons. We're trying to figure out where the problems are or the potential problems are and then how to structure our arrangement so that those potential problems tend to stay inside of the entity structure we've created and not find their way out to other parties that we don't want to have those liabilities or problems attached to, okay? And there are some trade-offs in the way we do that, which is why we're having this discussion. So let's talk about some categorical sort of liabilities. And you guys, let me get you guys involved in this. Let's think for a second. Think about an ordinary, let's talk about multifamily, just a, a normal multifamily setting. We've got an apartment complex, has multiple buildings, and it's located in Mobile, Alabama. All right. So first thing we need to be concerned about is where's it located? And, and that, that obviously, that, that's an easy answer, Mobile, Alabama. Why? Because we now need to make sure we understand what that business operations statutory and regulatory liabilities are, or responsibilities are going to be in that jurisdiction. So, and what could those be? So let's talk about categories for a second. What's an obvious one? What's an obvious state law, let me keep it, make it general, state law uh, requirement that every business has to comply with in every jurisdiction in the country, no matter what state or city or county it's in. Taxes, perfect, perfect. That's the place you sort of put that one right at the top of your, you know, top of your list, tax concerns. Now, that's a, really wide, that's a really wide subject area. So let's talk about some of the subcategories in the tax area. So let's go back to Mobile, Alabama, Multifamily property, what kinds of taxes do you think are going to be applicable to that kind of enterprise? What kind of taxes? Good. Ad valorem, we call them ad valorems, right? Ad valorem property taxes, property taxes. They, they, those are usually, again, 
subject to state law. But those are usually localized taxes here in Texas, county, city, right? And then and fire department and a whole bunch of other and school school districts. Here in, in Texas, we, we have a separate school district tax, statutorily different from most states, by the way. Okay, so property taxes. What's another one? Another category of taxes that you would expect an, any enterprise anywhere in the country to be responsible to for. Income taxes, right? We may have a, if we're in New York City, we have a New York City income tax, an actual income tax, an income tax return that is due to New York City, the city of New York City, okay? We don't have those here in Texas. We don't have income taxes in Texas, so it's a little unfamiliar territory for us, but it's good. So when you think income taxes, don't just think entity level income tax. Try to figure out what jurisdictions are involved. You may have state income tax. You may have a county income tax. You may have a city income tax. Okay, so, so now we have property taxes, ad valorem property taxes, and we have income taxes. What other kind of taxes might, mean, what might, might we run across in an enterprise? State. Okay, so when you describe real estate taxes, we're not talking about ad valorem property taxes. How would we be, what kind of real estate tax outside of the ad valorem property tax do, do you think we're talking about? The insurance is insurance. That's not tax, right? You actually might have an assessment on, it's actually, it's not a bad answer, but it's transactional. And in fact, we're dealing with it today in a closing today, in a loan closing today, and that is a mortgage tax, okay? A filing fee that is a mortgage tax that's payable upon the recordation of a mortgage in a location. In, by the way, in the same jurisdiction, they also have deed taxes, and you'll find deed taxes all over the country. That when you file the deed, it's subject to a tax against the value of the property that's being that's being recorded. Unlike Texas, where we don't really have that, and you you pay the filing fee on a per page basis for the deed, right? So so this is good. We're we're just sort of digging down into some specialized kind of taxes. Okay, what else? What other kinds of taxes might we have? got property taxes, we've got income taxes, we have recordations, sort of dean kind of taxes. What else might we have? What if I buy equipment for use at the property? You got it. Sales tax. Sales tax. What happens if I, if, 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 if I try to pay, play the fancy game and buy stuff on the internet uh, cross border from some supplier outside of the state and that particular supplier isn't really uh, a, a part of a, a network of, of people that are that are uh, assessing and requiring the payment of sales taxes on, on 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 the purchase and they sell it to you without the imposition of sales tax and it's coming from outside the state. They don't, they don't charge you sales tax properly. That's correct. And you bring it into the state and, and install it in your, your business, in your enterprise. What kind of tax might the state of Alabama have on that transaction? Well, the import export is usually a federal matter, right? That's a that's a national sort of you know cross border U.S. versus non U.S. But it's good you're getting you're getting close to it. I'll just give you the answer because it's a hard one. Use tax. So very often when people talk about sales taxes, you'll hear them say sales and use tax. And and you may have wondered up until today, what's use for? I don't have to pay to use it. I've already paid to buy it right? That's when use taxes get imposed. When you've bought it outside the state, have not paid a sales tax on it, did not pay a sales tax on it in this state. And by the way, the state 
under constitutional law, the state can't impose a sales tax on a sale that doesn't occur within their jurisdiction. You remember my story two weeks ago <laughs> about the aircraft sale? Okay. So, but what they can do is once that equipment comes into their jurisdiction, it now becomes taxable, not only for ad valorem property tax purposes, which by the way, we, we have here in Texas on personality. We don't just pay ad valorems on our real estate. We're also in business enterprises required to, to, to render our personality, our personal property, business personal property, desks, chairs, computers, you know, uh, it, manufacturing equipment, if you're in a manufacturing facility, we, we have to render the value of that every year on a schedule to the local uh, county, county assessor, tax collector, and then they send us a tax bill, and we've got to pay ad valorem property taxes on the personal tea that's in the business as well. So that's, that's just an aside. It's not, so it's not just the real estate, it's also the stuff that's sitting on the real estate that isn't considered real property. But back to use tax. So the obligation to pay use tax then attaches when you bring it into the state, you have an obligation to render and pay what is in effect the sales tax rate in that state on your acquisition of that equipment outside the state. Now, question, that doesn't seem fair. If I already paid sales taxes, if, if the person that, that, that charged me made me pay sales taxes out there, then why would I have to pay it here? Well, the argument would be if the party that, re that required you to pay sales taxes outside the state was actually doing it correctly, they may be party of what's called a multi-state compact where they've agreed with the state controllers of, you know, a whole bunch of states that they're going to be a party since they operate in multiple jurisdictions, that they're going to be a party that's responsible for collecting and remitting over to the right location, the right state under the right state tax rate, the sales tax that would otherwise be due and payable to a party who is taking delivery of those goods in that in, in, in a different state. Okay? So you see that, for example, in, in, in uh, I, look, I'm, I'm, I, I always hate to use actual names of businesses, right? I, I do it from time to time, so I won't do it. But, but many of us use an online shopping system these days that we get lots of regular deliveries at our home. And those things may be coming from a variety of places. And yet you'll see at the bottom of the page before you press pay that you're going to be charged a sales tax. That, that, so that party that is handling those sales is involved in one of these multi-state compact arrangements in which they're collecting the tax that would be assessed on you had you paid it in a local sale right here in Texas. And they know your jurisdiction because they know where they're shipping it to you. So they even go down to the zip code to calculate the rate that applies. And they've got a whole computer system, right, that loads all those rates as they change from year to year or time to time, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we've got sales and use tax. It's good. Anything else you can think of? Any other kinds of taxes? So we don't have income taxes here in Texas, right? But our companies, our entities, pay what's called a franchise tax. Franchise tax is a, you know, it's a different word and it's a different form of tax in Texas. And, and, and one of the important points, the, the, the important part I started with this morning or this afternoon was that, that real estate is local in nature. It's local in nature. So we've got to begin to ask questions at the local level. How, you know, how is this going to affect us? So the, the, the uh, sort of the overarching point is that local law, whether it's state law or county ordinance or city ordinance, those all affect the decisions you make on how you get into a business, what expenses you're going to have to pay when you're in, and how you get out and what it's going to cost you to get out. That analysis needs to be made from cradle to grave, as we sometimes say in the M&A business, in to exit. We need to make that analysis across the board and make sure we understand what it is we're stepping into so we can see what the net effect is when we get out. Even if we do all the things we say we're going to do or we project we're going to do, um, you know, in terms of operation and value creation, right? So, so we need to know, that, so the state franchise tax is an important one. It's an ongoing annual tax here in Texas. They vary. If, if franchise taxes, if income taxes are not imposed, at the entity level by a state, they usually impose some sort of franchise tax of some kind or another. 
on operating revenues of the company, which sounds like an income tax, but they call it a franchise tax, or some other um, some other calculated uh, assessment, uh, whether it's in part on value or some modified version of kind of an income tax, which is what Texas is, uh, the franchise tax, a bit of a modified income tax in that it looks at uh, gross receipts and allows only certain deductions from gross receipts and it imposes a tax if you're over a certain threshold. There's a minimum threshold that below that for small businesses, you don't have to pay a franchise tax. You still have to file a return. And it's a very short return, uh, no tax due return. But in any event, but so we're, so we're just about down to just about all of the major taxes that we would think about or be concerned about. Now, what we've talked about so far on the tax side is what happens at the entity level. And I need you to step back a bit further from that particular category of issue and ask yourself, all right, but what does this mean to the owners of the business? Not to the business itself inside that circle that we're choosing, but when we, when we, when we choose business organization structures, we need to look at what the tax effect is not only to the business, but also to the owners of the business. Because ultimately, as I've said before, it's not what you make, it's what you keep, right? So we then begin to ask questions about, all right, so if I use this form of entity, is there going to be a tax here? Like in corporations, you remember we talked about this. In a corporation, there's a tax at the entity level in the corporation. In the absence of an S corporation election, let's not talk about that for now. Uh, in a standard corporation, we've got a tax inside the corporation and a federal income tax and a return has to be paid. And there'd be in virtually every state, I mean, except in Texas, I mean, Texas, there's a few. Virtually every state, you've got a state income tax. There will be a, fed, there will be a state income tax return and a state tax that's got to, that has to be income tax that has to be paid by the corporation. If we have a limited liability company, are we going to have a tax, uh, a tax return at the federal level? Well, maybe, maybe not. If it's a single member limited liability company, we don't generally, I mean, you can make an election to be treated as a corporation and therefore pay a tax at the federal and at the federal level and file an 1120 at the federal level. But most LLCs that are single member LLCs are disregarded for federal tax purposes. And as a result, we don't really concern ourselves with the tax consequences in that setting because they just devolve dollar for dollar right up to the owner above it whether it's a company, a corporation, or an individual natural person that owns it. What about things like, and we haven't talked about this, so I want to get to this. This is sort of has some interesting, this particular one has some interesting complexity to it. And we'll get to it, you'll see it on the income statement. Employment taxes. Forgot about those, right? Employment taxes. So what does that really mean? What are employment taxes? Well, those are the taxes that are doing payable by the employer to federal and state taxing jurisdictions, and maybe even some local ta taxing jurisdictions in some settings, that collect taxes on the wage income of the employees. Part of that ends up being paid by the employee and part of it ends up being paid by the employer. And the employer is responsible for collecting all of those taxes, the, the employment taxes now. They're also responsible for collecting the income taxes and turning those over to the federal government and the state governments if in that state there is an income tax for which withholding is required, right? But it, so the employer has an employment tax liability, FICA, FUTA, you know, those sorts of things, Social Security. Uh, SSI, that, that end up being turned over to the federal government and in some parts to the state government and reports that have to be filed. So that's another set of, of issues that we need to concern ourselves when we structure. So let me, let me make a side point about this, uh, uh, about taxes before we move on to that. There's some nuance in the employment tax area that in some situations, at least back earlier in my practice, we would form limited partnerships and use them as investment vehicles to make sure that we avoided 
any imposition of employment taxes on the net earnings of the partnership to the partners, that none of those net earnings were, were subject to what are called self-employment taxes. It's the same, it's just a, it, it, it's a different regime, but intended to equate to W-2 employment taxes. And so you ask, wh why does that really matter? Well, if I'm an investor in a, in, a, in, in a general partnership, and I'm just putting in passively putting money into the general partnership, and in return for that, getting a 50% equity interest in the partnership, and partnership generates $100,000 worth of income, 50% of which is allocated to me, all $50,000 of that is going to be subject to self-employment tax because I'm in a general partnership. And there's no exception for passive ownership in a general partnership under the tax code. Long, long, long ago, back in the 80s, in the early 80s, there was, a, there was a move to make limited partners in limited partnership. It, literally, if you held a limited partnership, interest in a limited partnership, you are not subject to self-employment tax on your rateable share of gains. When limited liability companies came along, it took a little while for us to get to it, but ultimately the Internal Revenue Service ag agreed and decided that if you were a passive, passively involved as a limited liability company member, basically an investor in a limited liability company, that even though the code didn't provide for it under the appropriate code provision exemption, that it provided a limited partnership, limited partner, a limited partnership, an exemption from the self-employment tax. The service took the position that if you were a passive member of a limited liability company, you could analogously not be subject to the self-employment tax. But if you're an active member of a limited liability company, the argument is that your rateable share of income could very well be subject to self-employment tax, shows up on your personal tax return. So there are some times we use that one nuance in the law to say, well, okay, wait, wait, this is going inside of a limited partnership. Okay. We, 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 we don't want to have that imposition. What's important about that? That's a little nuance that's hanging around out there. What's important about that? Every single decision you make when you choose entities has consequences. And you have to know a wide variety of things, a wide variety of consequences that may attach to a particular organizational structure when you're making those decisions. Okay, so we've talked about tax a bit. What else? What other kinds of liabilities do we have? Environmental? Yeah, environmental liabilities. You know what? From a real estate perspective, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what structure we use. Environmental liabilities, they'll come and get you. If you go out and dock to do dump toxic stuff out in your property or you know that sort of stuff and there's a cleanup required, they're going to come find you. Yeah? And so it's, it, it's difficult to say that you can hide behind an entity shield in an environmental setting. There are some settings where there's some arguments that can be made, but that's a tough one. What other kinds of liabilities to third parties? We could have bank liability or contract liability. Well, that one's pretty easy in the law. Contract liability, which would also be a bank loan. I mean, a loan is a contract, right? Co contract liability attaches to the entity. It depends on the state law, and there are different decisions that get made from one state to the next. But generally across the country, Courts have agreed that if you have a contract with, with an entity, that the contracting party with that entity, unless they have a personal guarantee a gar or a guarantee from another party under the contract, they've got to look to the party they contracted with. And that liability stays right inside of the entity they contracted with. Okay? That, those are generally respected. There are some settings. I mean, we're not going to have a class about this. Uh, this is a completely different class. And, and that is what's called veil piercing. So understand that when we talk about protecting the, a, a business and putting it inside of a shell, like a corporation or a limited liability company or a limited partnership, to try to keep that business inside and the liabilities that occur or problems that occur inside of it, keep it from coming out and getting to the owners, back to the owners, there, there's a whole uh, a body of law that I refer to as veil piercing, where 
parties on the other side of that claim will say, wait a minute, the owners of this entity should not be entitled to use the shield of the company to protect themselves from liability to us for what they've done here. They've defrauded us. They've taken money out of the business and put, paid it off to somebody else and haven't paid us. They should have paid us. That'd be called fraudulent conveyance. There's a body of law out there that allows for parties that can't even contract inside with, with an entity to, to find ways to, to follow assets or to get through to owners. It's an extraordinary remedy and it's an extraordinary area of the law and we don't have time to cover it. But just recognize we're talking about principles where those th that body of law is not being applied in our setting. All right. So what other forms of liabilities would we have? And these are the ones that guys like me and folks like you, as you go on in the future, will you, 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 you lose a little sleep at night over. What kind of bad things can happen inside of our, our uh, Mobile, Alabama residential real property, multifamily real property? What kinds of bad things can happen? Good. An employee what? What about an employee? Give me an example. No, just say it. Say it. It's okay. It's just a discussion. Okay, so so whether whether I mean whether it's a current issue or not, embezzlement, theft, fraud, employee related, or, or even agent related, theft, fraud, and the like. That's one category of liability derives from folks that we've hired, know, have relationships with, right? What's another form of liability that we see quite often, and in in our hotel, in our in our hotels also from time to time. Right, but but what kind of liability from a customer or a tenant? Okay, an injury, perfect. A slip and fall, we call it slip and fall, right? Somebody somebody gets injured on the premises, whether it's a tenant that we have a contract relationship with under a lease or what we refer to in the law as an invitee, somebody that we've invited onto the property that we don't have a contract relationship with or... Let's talk, about, let's talk about third parties that we do have contract relationships with, like our vendors who come in and do our unit turns. Some contractor comes on the site. We've got, we have that going on. We have litigation going on right now in, in Oklahoma over a property that we had where one of the painting crews, third party painting crews, came in and some guys were working overnight, you know, blah, 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 blah. And some guy, you know, with a lot of fumes around, lit a cigarette. Inside the apartment, place blew up, started on fire, killed two guys, just craziness. I mean, one guy died instantly and the other guy died three days later in the hospital. So injury cases, right? We may or may not have a contract relationship with the party if they're an invitee, but we've, we, th those kinds of injury cases are liabilities to the entity, to the property owner, right? Uh, we're, uh, we've got a case where uh, we're, we're working on a curbside area in a median as you drive in and and one of the water mains or water supply areas needed to have work done on it. So they dug a you know big hole down to get down to the line and they placed tape around it and 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 they have worked you know worked on it. we're working on it for weeks. Some resident comes through in the dark of the night and literally not paying attention, literally walks into the hole and breaks her leg. Right? There's just stuff that happens, things you can't predict, right? So, so these are what we call tort liabilities, tort liabilities, T-O-R-T, -T, just like it sounds. Not something you eat, by the way. So um, anyway, th so, so these are the, some, of the some of the categories of things we think about. By the way, how do we normally handle a, handle a tort liability? What, what do we normally do to protect ourselves as business owners in tort liability situations? What's the principal means by which we protect the, the enterprise? Well, that's a way we, yeah, that's a way we, we, we finalize and cut off potential liability, right? But what's the, what, what, what's the normal means by which 
we, we address or make sure we're prepared for some kind of slip and fall liability. You got it. Insurance, right? Standard operating procedure is to get the right kind of general liability and property and casualty insurance and DNO, ENO, and the like, right? Just get pro pro appropriate levels of insurance. However, insurance has limits. And the tenant's claim, if it was a death claim or the like, tenant, the tenant's claim may be well in excess of, or purportedly in excess of, the limits on the policy. So what are we doing there? How do we protect? Well, let's talk about one nuance, and then, we're, and then we're, I'm going to call the guys in on financial statements. Let's talk about one nuance here on structure. So ordinarily, what we do in our multifamilies is we put the multifamily property inside a particular entity, a specific entity. We don't put multiple properties inside the same entity. We don't want one liability, one slip and fall case over in, in, in Birmingham, Alabama, to come over and hit a potential value property in Mobile, Alabama, or vice versa. So we create separate subsidiaries for each one of those properties. We go one step further in the liability setting in our hotel system, in our hotel systems, and that is we actually create two different subsidiaries, one for operations and one for property ownership. Property owner doesn't operate the property, doesn't, right? It just doesn't operate it. It owns the property, it has insurance on the property, and it enters into a lease agreement with an operating entity, and the lease, the, the operating entity then pays rent back over to the PropCo, we call it PropCo and OpCo, in which we've then separated out potential operational liability, operational liability, we've separated that out and tried to make sure that to the extent there's a slip and fall claim, that the claim hopefully gets made against the operational company and not against the crown jewel. Right? That, that, that's what's going on there. There's also a franchise relationship in a hotel setting that causes us to want the franchise agreement to be over in another entity, not in the property owning company. Several ways to set that up. But hopefully you're beginning to see that there are reasons why we, we, we make a choice of entity and we choose how we operate those entities and how we arrange them in our own structures so that we can keep uh, potential extraordinary things that happen from time to time that may run outside of insurance from getting to the crown jewel or getting through that entity out to the prop to the owners the equity owners which is the real reason that we kind of set all these things up you also have other classes of liability securities liability reporting liability uh, to agencies and and some other classes of liabilities so um i but but i thought we'd cover some of those uh, let me make sure we've got, uh, yep. And then liabilities to managers, members, and officers. So the entity itself may have indemnity liability or responsibilities to its officers, its managers, and its employees. If something bad happens and the employee or the officer gets tagged for that, even and, and they aren't found to be responsible for it, the entity has responsibilities to the, to the officer, the employee or the director or the manager in that situation to indemnify them and pay them back for any losses that would incur. Now, back to my first point of the day, all of this is subject to state law. So that gets us to the sort of the next fundamental point, And that is, and I'm going to call, I'm going to use a, a term that we use in, in several settings, forum shopping. We forum shop. So we choose the local law, the state law that we want to govern our arrangements between us and our equity partners, our equity providers, our lenders, and the like, to the extent we can, we choose law that works in our favor. So depending upon which side we're on, we may want to choose one form of state law. I'll give you an example. The Delaware Limited Liability Company Act is a contract act. We can put anything we want in a limited liability company agreement, and it's just about sure to be enforceable under Delaware law. If I take you to Florida and we use the Florida Limited Liability Company Act, there are a whole lot of provisions in the Florida Limited Liability Company Act that impose actual liability on and give rights and remedies to
to members, managers, and other folks in the limited liability company setting that are not available under Delaware law. And so if we don't provide for that in our contract under Delaware law, the operating agreement, then the parties aren't entitled to that. So if what I want to do is have an environment where we create the setting, we create the rules, we create who's in control, how the control works, how it, how it operates and what responsibilities we have to each other. And then if you're getting out, what the consequences are, we'll use Delaware. If I'm on the other side and I'm uh, representing a minority interest holder, but I have enough you know, power to be able to negotiate where we go for uh, the, the, the choice of law on a limited liability company agreement, I may well use Texas because Texas has some of those imposed uh, uh, obligations and, and rights also. But if I really want a really strong one, I might go straight to Florida and use the Florida LLC Act because it's, it's, it, it can be better, can be, can be better under a, a number of circumstances for minority members of limited liability companies. Again, it's about freedom of contract and Florida's decided that it has freedom of contract too, but there's still a bunch of statutory principles that get applied um, that, that would make us choose that over another act in certain settings. And so we need to know the exact questions to be asked in the exact circumstances. All right, we got started a little bit late today. It's now five minutes till. So I've got about probably, I mean, if I use it right, about 12 minutes. And so what I wanted to do is call a couple guys in and ask them just a couple of questions uh, about looking at balance sheets and income statements. So in front of you today, uh, it was, was Tony gonna come in and talk about Shiloh? Yeah, he is. Yeah, Tony, come on in um, and let's talk about Shiloh Creek. So what we have in front of us is uh, on Shiloh Creek is uh, you have you should have a balance sheet first thing and an income statement. So I'm going to run down through you real quickly and 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 point out a couple of things that as a commercial lawyer when I look at a balance sheet and income statement here's some of the things that I see. So balance sheet, cash. Look at that second line. See what it says? Security deposits. Oh oh wait a minute. Security deposits. Ah, I have a client that has security deposits. There are very specific obligations under state law related to security deposits. So one of the things you'll find out, watch this, because these guys are going to say something different. I don't ever look at the right-hand side of the balance sheet or the income statement. None of it matters to me. Stories of potential problems, liabilities, or issues I should be thinking about in connection with an acquisition. Tell me about your business. So the question is, what does a balance sheet and an income statement tell me about this particular business? So utility deposits, real estate taxes, standard stuff, right? Pool and spa. Uh-oh. Got a pool on a place. Liability, right? Should just These are the kinds of things we start to think about. So I see it differently. Tenant improvements, construction management. Oh, construction management. Guess what? I've got construction going on on the property, other liabilities, and I probably have a construction management agreement, so I need to make sure I look for that. This is what I see when I look down through a financial statement, all right? Vehicles, oh, I've got vehicles on the property or own, owned vehicles, and I've got other sources of liability, right? Okay, taxes, deposits again, notes payable. Um, okay, notes payable, that's just the first mortgage, standard stuff. Oh, interesting. Get back to that last page. Look at that last page. The equity. We have preferred equity in this structure. Oh, it looks like we've got a second class of equity and a third class of equity. Wow. Okay. So that just piques my interest in the capital structure of the deal. I need to understand who's involved and get perspective over that. So that's how I see an income state or a, a balance sheet, an income statement. Employees. Look at the right. I got okay. I've got employees. Well, of course, I've got employees. I mean. I, yeah very likely have employees, right? I mean, be a, a little unusual not to have employees. Um, cable services, credit builder, laundry income. Okay, so I probably have contracts with some credit builder thing, some cable service, some laundry service of some kind or another that I need to be looking for. Um, what, what, what else do we have? And I'm just flipping through this quickly with you. Okay, on, I've got wages, obviously, so I've got employees. We have bonuses and commissions, payroll taxes, benefits, uh-oh, different source of law, benefits. Need to look into that and make sure we've covered the benefits area properly when we do the acquisition. Workers' comp, okay? 
hey, I'd like to know what the workers' comp liability rate is. I'd like to know whether there's been an adjustment to that rate over time. I'd like to know whether we're functionally self-insured, th those sorts of things. That, that raises those questions for me. Oh, fitness equipment maintenance. You think I care about the maintenance? No. We've got liability. We've got an exercise room. <laughs> so now all of a sudden I see exercise room. Again, we've got a golf cart. Oh, great. Somebody's going to flip the golf cart over and you know have an accident or run over somebody. Perfect. Um, we've got utilities, electric, gas, water, sewer. We've got a utility processing line. I don't really care about that as much, but I start asking questions about how the utilities get supplied, whether we have uh, reservation fees, whether reservation fees are needed for expansion, those sorts of things in those kinds of settings. Uh, we, we've got market research. Watch this one. This is an interesting one. Get, I, mean, I bet not many of you would see this. Signage expense. Oh God. Now we've got a sign. Now I have to figure out whether we're compliant with our, you know, with our sign, our billboard sign or whatever it is, if we've got one of those. So these are the kinds of things you'll see when, when, when I start looking through, as a lawyer, start looking through a balance sheet or an income statement, all right? So now with Tony standing here, Tony, let me ask you a question. I've just kind of explained the kinds of things I see. As an asset manager, come on, join me on the camera here. This is Tony Perez. He's the uh, director of our asset management department. So Tony, as an asset manager, when you look at a, a balance sheet, what's the the first thing that you're drawn to on a balance sheet? Now we're talking about multifamily here, right? So, right. Uh, great question. Uh, when I look at a balance sheet, the first thing I'm drawn to is uh, networking capital. Um, what I mean by that, the textbook definition would be current assets less current liabilities. Um, more specifically, I'm looking at um, networking capital with respect to operating cash less um, my current liabilities for accounts payable, um, which is going to be in current liability section, and then accrued interest. Um, so that tells me is there enough cash in the bank today to service my very, very current obligations? So that would be AP trade and then accrued interest. Um, and then, because that's, do I have enough cash to pay my bills? And if you don't pay your bills, things can happen. If you don't pay your mortgage, worse things can happen. Um, so that's very important. Um, and then taking that a little bit broader, the whole concept of networking capital, including all current assets, which is the middle of that first page, CCA, that takes into account anything that's going to be something that needs to be paid in a year um, or in the course of a year, basically. And then my total current liabilities on that second page towards the bottom there is going to be any liabilities that are going to be, need to be any obligations from that year. And so here we're pretty healthy. Um, we've got plenty of current assets to cover our total current liabilities. From a cash standpoint, we actually have enough, we have enough to pay our accrued interest. So typically accrued interest, this is a 531 balance sheet, right? So your mortgage, if y'all have ever, if y'all understand the concept of mortgages, your mortgage payments are paid like in arrears. So that accrued interest is accrued for May and gets paid in June. So I've got enough money on hand to pay that. If I were to pay that, I don't have enough money to pay all my accounts payable, which is not necessarily a bad thing because typically your accounts payable, you're able to pay your vendors in zero to 30 days. So what I usually do from this point is I would actually pull a sub ledger report for accounts payable and see how much of that is older than 30 days. Um, and how much of that is th are things like utilities where you don't really want to pay it. You just pay those kind of right away. Um, and uh, also, with respect to multifamily, have, if y'all, if any of y'all lease an apartment, when's your rent due? On the first of the month. So on June 1, the following day of this, of this I'm going to have more income coming in, right? So uh, this is actually a pretty healthy balance sheet, um, considering the fact that we do have prep equity and debt. And so leverage is pretty is pretty high here um and then the so first point is you're you're current asset. most interested in working capital. working capital do i have working capital yes right? current obligation yeah yeah 
And and so when you look at an income statement, then what's what's the the thing that you're drawn to uh, first in, in, in as an issue? Yeah, um, great question. So um, on the income statement, I, I basically start top down, um, but I will also I stop I start top down after checking one thing usually, which is if I'm looking at this for the first time. But if this is not, this is probably it's not familiar to me. Um, would be NOI. Um, very sad. Um, and then my total debt service. So just wanted to make sure this property is actually meeting its debt services pretty healthily here. Um, and I usually also will look at total net income at very very bottom line. Just actually, if it's in parentheses, by the way. You see something in parentheses on an income statement, it's a negative. Something that y'all might not be used to that if you haven't taken any accounting classes. Um, however, that line is not, knowing this property, it's a big negative, right? That is, what's that net income after capital rehab? That negative 380, y'all see that? It's like y'all have lost 380,000 for the year. Not really, it's after capital rehab. And how much is that capital rehab? $900,000 and that capital rehab is actually funded out of a reserve which is not on the balance sheet because we draw on it from um, the I'll get into that later so but I'll, I'll look at the, the to your question the first thing I look at is NOI and debt service just to familiarize myself is this thing like meeting its debt service does it have debt right the first question then does it meet its debt service and then I kind of start top down so um, with multifamily, you can see that very first subtotal is called gross potential rent. That is a really good indication of your average rent per month total. Not quite that calculation, but it's your average rent if you were fully occupied, basically. So is that number going up or down over the 12 months? It's going up. That's kind of what I look at. And then... Um, that's a good thing. It means I'm growing my rental rates. Um, and then I look at my, your second subtotal is your rental losses. So I kind of start, I'll look at the bottom line total there. And you've got net rental income. Your rental losses are the ones that you'd probably think of vacancy loss. We actually recognize vacancy loss as a loss, which means we actually recognize it in potential rent. So we recognize potential rent. That's 100% occupied. Well, you're never 100% occupied. That's why it's called potential rent. It's kind of a fake number in a sense. And then you take away all these rental losses. And so that's, that's what your true rental income was. And so I look at that number. Is that number growing? Yeah, it's growing. But there are some instances in this month where it went down. So in this year. So in August, our net rental income was 157000 and some change. And then the following month in September... It was 150,000. Even though my rental rates didn't go down or kind of stayed the same, my net rental income went down. And that's because we recognized some more losses. And those can be anything from vacancy to concessions. You've got an employee unit. So this person lives on site. They're an employee. And we give them a rental discount. That's a good thing, by the way, because that means you, so they're part of their compensation is in their rental discount. Um, and they're on site. So that means they're really in tune with the property. They know what's going on. After hours, things like emergencies they can handle. Um, and then you've got bad debt. So do you guys know what bad debt is? If you, if you have it, if you don't know what bad debt is, it's okay. Um, it's an accounting, uh, it's an accounting term, but it, it basically means that you recognize that revenue at some point in time and didn't actually get it. And then you had to write it off as a bad debt expense. That means your accounts receivable got on the balance sheet. That goes back to the balance sheet. So you're about, if you figure your balance sheet, you had accounts receivable from your residence. For, for one reason or the other, you didn't collect it. You recognized it in one period, even though you didn't get it. It stayed in the balance sheet. It didn't get converted to cash. You never got that cash and you had to actually recognize as a loss when you determined you couldn't get it. And there's other income. There's like a ton of lines. You're like, what's all this other income? 
we make a lot of other income and there's a lot of different categories of it. Majority of these, this other income is actually described in the leases. So app or in the lease package. So the lease package would be your application and your lease basically. So you apply for, to rent an apartment and you pay certain fees associated with that. And there's background checks and stuff like that. Um, income verification. And then you have a lease. Those things, those two things together is like the lease packet. And a lot of those fees are tied to that whole process of like entering into the lease or are tied to the lease. So like application fees, you pay an application fee, that application fee gets give. We take that application fee and we pay to get a credit check run and all those kinds of things. Administrative fee. It's like a move in fee. There's damage fees. There's cleaning fees. There's late fees. There's a lock and rekey fee, early termination fee, month to month fees. These are all fees that are actually in the lease, the document themselves and certain things trigger them. An NSF fee, you submitted a check and it bounced, basically. Um, that's a fee. These are all the lease and, you know, it, we, it, it's contractual. Um, reimburse, even the reimbursements are contractual. You sign an addendum that says we can charge you back for your utility usage. And, um, and then some of these things are not in the lease, like the cable service income. That's more of a, that's a vending relationship we have with the cable service provider and they give us a revenue share. Right. You remember I, I, I was talking about that when I looked at that, those lines and said, oh, cable revenue, that tells me there's an outside relationship. Yeah. Right. So you I'm see how to, differently. I'm getting into the degree here. Sorry. I, I, I'll, I'll, I digress. So there's payroll or now I go through all the different kind of line items and um, without a budget to compare it to, I, I, I'm going off of kind of feel and trend on the t trailing 12 month, um, which is why you usually do like a budget comparison. And then I'll look for big jumps on expenses, big drops or jumps on income and try to, and kind of what's going on there. Um, and, um, yeah. And so another thing you want to look at too, um, would be your, um, your fixed expenses like taxes and insurance are big ones. So um, those are typically fixed and very large. Payroll is probably another big expense line item you want to pay attention to, um, things of that nature. Um, so big issues tend to be, sounds like, tend to be working capital, working capital. And, and, and really kind of net cash flow. Net cash flow is number one thing too as well. Yeah, so... So, so in summary, as we're talking about this, and again, I mean, we can really dig down to the details, and we'll have Greg talk to us in a second about the the delta about about hotel for a second. But, but, but you can see how very different my view of a balance sheet and income statement is, and what I use it for, versus what we use it for in operations and management. Right? How very different those views are. And, and, and by the way, I mean, you all know I have a master's in accounting, so I can sit down with Tony and we can go through these lines and I can, you know, sort of follow this stuff with him and we can talk back and forth between balance sheet and income statement, those sorts of things. But, and I use that, that education and that understanding to, to talk with people in, in the operation about taxes and, and, and all kinds of other things operationally and how we should book them maybe or not, depending upon what we're trying to achieve. But at the end of the day, we view these resources differently. And, and so we, we try to do th different things with them. So don't just, and this is why I ask you to do standing here, don't simply you know, get your hands on an income statement or a balance sheet and start looking over on the right-hand side and start looking at the numbers. People tend to do that, right? Your tendency is to go right to the right-hand side and say, okay, see how this is thing, the thing is doing. If you're Tony... Or Greg, if that's what you do for a living and that's what your, your response is, that's what you should be doing. But on a secondary level, we should be doing some more things with our balance sheets and income statements. I sort of look at them you know, from the flip side and then I'll look back over the numbers and go, okay, well, somebody's got to do a better job on this, <laughs> right? If it's not doing very well or somebody's done a really great job on this, this is great. But right, do you see what I'm saying? So information is different depending upon our perspective and we can use it differently. Okay, Greg, come on in here. Let's talk about for, about the the, the uh, South Lake the uh, the hotel, um, and and I'll just ask him the same question. What I've given you is a very short, um, it's just three 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 pages uh, of the Delta South Lake um, 
and he's not going to get, he's going to get my, because I, I can't read the tiny little print that you guys can read without my glasses on. I don't want to stick my glasses on today. I went and photocopied off and enlarged just on a category basis. So he didn't get to look through all of his fancy numbers except current year to date. But, but so, Greg, same question to you. When you look at a balance sheet, what's on a, on a hotel operation, what's the sort of, what are you drawn to first? Um, I, th I think Tony hit, I think, a common thread here, which is, um, you know, current cash flow, whether or not I have enough cash in the bank to pay my bills. So I always look at a, accounts payable and accounts receivable. Um, you know, from a real estate perspective, I always like to see the breakout of, um, you know, land to building price and things like that. Um, hotels have somewhat limited inventory, but inventory counts. So I'd like to know, you know, in the, in the restaurant, how much food we're holding and beverage at the bar. Um, you know, so inventory controls in, important as well. Uh, oh, interesting point. He's talking about inventory. That's great. We don't really have an inventory in multifamily, right? I mean, generally there's not an inventory. As soon as I see inventory in a hotel, I go, okay, I probably got F and B, food and beverage, and therefore I had licensure liability, I had food liability, I've got a whole bunch of other things to worry about. Don't worry about that in multifamily. Don't worry about that in the manufacturing setting. But don't worry about it in, in, in hotel operation, right? No, another set of issues that we need to be concerned with. Okay? So, so he's looking at it basically the same kinds of things. What, what about on an, on an income statement? I mean, from the income statement, what are you first sort of drawn to on the income statement? So uh, I think one of the key differences between multifamily and hospitality is how dynamic the hospitality and seasonal that, that type of business is. I mean, I, you know, if you look at I, what I appreciate about legal, the legal aspect is that you see, you know, the entity for what it is, the business for what it is, and there's you know, it doesn't matter what you're doing, but you've got some revenue and you've got some expense and you have uh, a, a portion of it that you could control and a portion of it that's fixed. And so I always like to focus on kind of the top half of the, uh, of the income statement, which is basically everything to operating profit. So it's everything that I can control. And at this point, I've been doing it for so long that I tend to look at the numbers and the relationships sure, between them. Um, it's a lot harder to, um, to tell based on uh, trailing 12 when all the numbers are lined up. But, you know, in, in hotels, we always have uh, our actuals for the month versus our budget versus last year. And so that way you can see small trends as they start to, uh, to come up. And it's whack-a-mole at that point. Whenever we're going through an income statement on a monthly financial review, you know, we're, we're hitting things that pop up, making sure that we address them before they're big, big issues. And, you know, labor control is one of the things that's most important right now in our industry. So, so that raises a great point. And I, I want to finish with this. I was going to have Chris come in today, but we've, I've, I've already run too long. I spent too much time talking and got here too late. Thank you, Greg. Um, but, but I wanted to, because I wanted an, uh, from an underwriting perspective to ask our guys, and maybe we'll get a chance to do that um, in, in my last session, we'll ask the underwriters how they view a financial statement. But but that uh, Greg's point about looking at the bigger numbers, that's the other thing that happens even when I view a financial statement. And I said to you earlier something categorical, which isn't quite true. And that is, I don't even look at the numbers. It doesn't matter to me what's on the right-hand side. Actually, the truth is, after I've looked through it the first time and I've kind of identified and got, I have my head filled with the fundamental areas I'm going to need to be dealing with and potentially any nuances. And I've usually made it, started to make a list for myself, or I'll just write directly on the income statement of the balance sheet. Then I'll go over and look at the numbers on the right to see if there are any things that look like they are huge outliers. The kinds of things that from a managerial perspective, because I have a bit of an accounting background, I'll look to see if something looks like it's way out of whack. And if it's way out of whack, I'm going to highlight that area, even if I hadn't highlighted it before, thinking it's a routine, and dig down into that with the people who are actually doing the diligence to try to figure out why those numbers were the way they are. And let me close with this one, uh, th this one observation. How many of you have had accounting? I know I've asked this question before. How many of you had accounting? Just about everybody. If you haven't had an accounting class, you're going to go into business, go get it. You need to have accounting. 
Right? You just have to have accounting. You have to. You have to be able to look at it and understand why, how, how those relationships work. And what did I say to you earlier about, uh, about accounting and, and, and financial statements in general? It's not what they tell you. It's what they don't tell you, in my view. It's what they don't tell you. So we can look through all these numbers and they can, you know, everything will look great and everything else. But these, these financial accounting numbers, and Tony didn't address this. He sort of hinted at it, but he didn't address it directly. And that is, depends on what method of accounting we're using to determine what those numbers actually mean. So Tony talked about accruing rent and then having to write it off and having bad debt. That's an accrual concept. If we kept our books on the cash basis, there would be no bad debt. Okay, we, we wouldn't see that line item. So we need to understand what methods are being used. Furthermore, the next important point is, and Tony does this almost in his head because he does it all the time. We talk about this from time to time, we have over the years. And that is when you manage, you don't really, you can't really manage off a gap financial statement because a gap financial statement has concepts of accrual and other things in it that don't match up with cash. So Tony's doing do, doing and all the asset managers are doing calculations either on a spreadsheet or in their heads to make the adjustments for the timing differences in the accounting entries that look like they mean something on the paper, but they won't mean something until later in actual reality in the bank account, right? Collection in the bank account or expense getting paid out of the bank account. So, so financial statements are an attempt under the under GAAP rules and even IRS rules are an attempt to try to provide us with an economic picture of what something looks like at any given point in time. But it doesn't mean that that's actually what's standing in front of us, right? So, so just understand that when we look at this information, we really have to know what we're looking at and what its limits are, and then go to people who really understand what they are, circle some questions, and go to somebody like Tony and say, okay, wait a minute, why am I seeing an outlier here? What does this mean operationally and what's really happening? Where did this come from? Why is this weird? You know, why is this relationship weird? These are our, all diligence matters and these are all things that come back to, for me, come back to choice of entity that may be operational in nature. In the, in the, in the, the previous owner may have operational issues that we may need to address that may float over to us in the future irrespective. It's not going to stay inside of their entity. It's going to float right over to us. And now we have to deal with it. How are we going to fix that? How are we going to make sure it doesn't end up outside of the entity or create some liability that we didn't intend? Okay. So point of today really was, and I'm sorry to have taken so much more time. The goal of today was to give you a bit more flavor, color, and flesh on choice of entity and decisions we make. And then more importantly, the categories of things we need to be thinking through as we choose an entity or a structure, okay? And there's a, as I've said, there's a whole laundry list of them. Hopefully I've covered most of them today. Again, as always, if you guys have questions, you feel free to email me, um, you know, and, and, and ask questions. Uh, uh, if you want more information, I can provide you with some additional information. Most of the stuff that I work off or from uh, are really pretty heavy duty legal sources. And so, you know, anything I would forward on to you might you know, have some pretty heavy legal emphasis in it. It might, might be a little bit more than you want. Uh, it might be good sleep, you know, sleep type, you know, bedtime reading. But, um, but I'm happy to to coalesce that into some more um, uh, general thoughts if if that's helpful for you. Okay, all right. It's great to see you guys again. I'll see you one more time this summer. Until then, be well. Thanks. Mm-hmm.